computer. All right, good morning, everybody. This is our third round of um, bike fitting uh, webinars. We got another expert uh, panel. This, uh, this time we're gonna focus on general fitting for the triathlon market. Uh, we're gonna getting into a little bit of uh, fitting processes and philosophies and fitting for the triathlete. Uh, we have our panel here. Uh, my name is Rick from Bike Fitness Coaching. And let me uh, kick it off over to Michael Sylvester, who's going to be the moderator today. Uh, Michael, take it from there and then go ahead and uh, have the, pass it around and have the rest of the panel introduce themselves as well. Okay. Well, Michael Sylvester, Bicycle Fitting Services, Portland, Oregon. Um, long history in bike fitting. Uh, was the co-creator of Serata's Fit Program way, way back. Um, also did Trex fit program. So I've been around the block with teaching and doing fittings. Um, this is year number 42 for me. So I've done a couple fittings before. Uh, Rick talked to, watched the first couple webinars and was excited and thought, huh, this is cool. So I called Rick and um, I'm honored to be here helping do the moderation and uh, yes, I'm glad to talk about triathlon fitting, but I'm also going to throw in a few questions before that just to kind of help the direction of some of the webinars and broaden our base a little bit. So uh, I guess Anne's up next. Um, hello. Um, thank you, Rick, for inviting me onto this panel. Um, I started getting into fitting when I started working in a bike shop, 2004. Uh, I would say my formal training began with Mike Sylvester. So it's uh, thanks to him that I've continued on and kept the interest. I worked in Chicago, uh, been through a couple of shops and opened my own studio six years ago. Um, in this market, it's a huge triathlon market. And because it's cold six months out of the year, I think uh, Chicago really rather invented the indoor training systems in some ways and life in a big city. Uh, so I'm looking forward to answering questions, uh, listening to everybody else and learning some more as myself. Okay, how about uh, Matthew? Oh, it would be, Matthew, are you on the panel or? I am. I am here to listen and learn. Okay, so I'd be all I am, next. Uh, I'm a humble observer. Okay. How about Tom? Thanks for having me. My name is Tom Wiseman. Um, I've been in the industry for about 27 years. I've been fitting for 12. Uh, ironically, I got involved as a student of Michael Sylvester as well, um, some umpty ump years ago, and uh, started my own uh, independent practice five years ago. I've uh, been fitting, fitting full time every day since then. Um, it's been an interesting road to say the very least. Uh, you never really know what's going to happen until you start seeing people on bikes every day of the week. So i um, happy to lend what I can and learn everything that I can absorb today. So thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Great. Uh, if happy's there, we can. No, he happy, said he was just about yet. to call in. So yeah, he's, he's, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to all. I'll bring him in as soon as he shows up. Okay. okay. Yeah, but let's go with Paul, Paul next. Okay, Paul. William's here and uh, thanks uh, Rick for for doing this. I'm, 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 I've am I'm been excited about being a part of it for a while and uh, uh, happy, happy. Uh, happy introduced us. So I'm grateful that that happened. Um, I've been around forever uh, in the bike industry since 1983. Uh, started playing around with bike fitting mid eighties. Um, Mike, we had the, we had the very first Serata size cycle, the red one with, uh, I think it was yellow decals. Um, so I remember, uh, uh, getting started then we were a Serata dealer and, uh, sort of, uh, done everything else in this industry, uh, client facing, um, started as a mechanic service manager, got into the sales management bike fitting kind of all along the way, uh, avid cyclist, 
uh, my whole life, uh, bike racer, um, still at all that stuff. Um, somewhere around uh, 2003 or so um, in the environment I was in, I was bike fitting almost all day, every day. And that's kind of been what I've done most since then. Uh, started my own business bike fitting in 2000, in uh, 2011. And um, we are in our own, that's looked like a few things over the years, um, partnering with bike shops, mobile fitting, different things like that. Um, opened our own brick and mortar um, uh, fit studio. Uh, it's a fit studio and then some, uh, we call it Perfect Fit Fix and Ride. Uh, that happened five years ago. And um, since then, uh, it's just exploded. We're, we're in 1,500 square feet. Um, we're about to lease, uh, about to double our size, uh, trying, hiring staff, trying to keep up. So exciting time for us. And i um, grateful to be a part of this. Great. All right. Well, I think that's Happy's not here yet, but we'll yeah, I see him. I think he just here. clicked in. Happy right. just, yeah, Happy's here. I've been here for about 10 minutes with technical difficulties. Okay. So Happy, okay. little introduction. Hi there. My name is Happy Friedman. Next to Michael Sylvester, I'm probably the oldest bike fitter you'll meet. I've been fitting for about 40 some odd years. I started in 1978. I fit everything from hip replacements to knee replacements. I hit, hit fit for back surgery. In other words, I, I see the garbage you don't want. In addition to working with bike racers, triathletes, and assorted other people interested in riding or rehab. Great. I'm a generalist. There we go. All right, Michael, go ahead and kick it off, and let's. Uh, uh, which uh, tell us how you're going to um, run the the questionnaires and stuff, so we know what to uh, expect here, and uh, we'll move forward. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm gonna say uh, that I'm visiting my sister in Hawaii right now, so I'm gonna say aloha to you all. Um, it's early here, so it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning here. So it's a little early start for me. Um, I have talked to Rick quite a bit about the webinars and where they're going and what we're doing with these webinars. And I think they're great, but I wanted to put out some ideas and help with them. So definitely today, there's always lots to talk about with triathlon fitting. Uh, lots of things that we could spend the whole time on one question, but mm -hmm. we're going to have more than one question. So keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to take a couple questions worth of time and get some general ideas or talk about some things that could be of value to somebody watching the webinar in terms of maybe they aren't experts, maybe they're just looking at the idea of doing better fittings. So what could we do to help those people? So question one for me that I'd like to hear and um, maybe we can share with our audience. Um, what are the most important parts of your fitting process or philosophy that you'd like to share? The most important parts of your fitting process or philosophy that you would like to share. And whoever I'll go first. To take um, that. I think whether it's try or mountain bike or anything, the most important philosophy is to listen to the rider and understand what they want, uh, particularly a triathlon. Uh, I worked a lot of with a lot of first timers. Uh, the last shop I worked in specialized in turning people into triathletes. So that first conversation was, do you have a bike? What kind of bike do you want? Um, are you doing a sprint distance? Or are you doing an Olympic distance? Uh, so getting to understand what their goals are 
uh, will help them and help you get to, as I say, either the beer tent on time or to the finish line. Uh, so I find that you've got to understand that rider's needs uh, before you even start measuring anything. That's my secret. And do you have any specific things that you do um, in your process that you feel like are unique or different than what everybody else is doing? I, I hope not. It, you know, in some ways, uh, I think... Uh, Understanding, or this sounds terrible, uh, a lot of triathletes are not cyclists. And I mean that in a nice way. They are runners. They are swimmers. They might be right. a bike rider, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, and obviously, we live in the big city here. Do you want to try bike or do you want a road bike? And, you know, for what you want, do you want to ride more? Or do you want to train more? Uh, what do you feel comfortable and confident on? And comfort and confidence, that has to go together. And whether it's your shoe fit to your saddle comfort to your arm pad position. Um, I, don't, I hope I don't do anything different than anybody else. I don't think I'm very fancy in that regard. I try to be sensible. Um, and uh, is that a good answer? <laughs> I mean, we all work from the same um, uh, basics, you know, of let's say knee angle or can you see where you're going? Can you breathe? Um, I would say actually, can you see where you're going is my big secret, right? Everybody wants to be arrow and go fast, right. but can you see where you're going? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, I get all kinds of people that I get to see. And so we use words like people who are riding a road bike or a triathlon bike, but even within those categories, you might have someone who has seen aero bars and says, wow, should I put those on my road bike? Should I, you know, what, what's that all about? And so we become educators, right? So oh, absolutely. I guess what I'm asking or in that question is um, not that you're different in your fitting, any of you, but you have a philosophy um, and I, maybe I'll share quickly what I, you know, when I work with someone, I kind of take the eraser to the chalkboard and I clear the board and I say, what I try to figure out, it's like a murder mystery. What, what are they doing? And what do they want to do? What is this person's, what, what are they trying to accomplish? So for, for you, um, I, I wanted to create a uh, webinar today where we talk about it so other fitters or other wannabe fitters can kind of hear our processes that we think you know, how, how we're doing this, how we're approaching it, because you don't do the same fitting for somebody who's an elite level road rider who's setting up their triathlon bike that, that you would with someone who's just putting aero bars on their road bike and maybe doing a, a first triathlon or something like that. So it's very different. And I just wanted to give you each an opportunity to kind of talk about how you approach that, how you look at that, how, how do you find out what they're doing, you know, what's going on there. So, yeah, no, no specific thing I'm looking for, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to address that. Happy is next. Well, there are a bunch of things I look for. The first one is, do they belong on a tri bike? Are they capable of riding it safely? Will they be faster or slower? on a tri bike as opposed to their road bike or another road bike? Or is it going to be their training bike? We need to know all this. I also want to know, do they know how to pedal a bike? And by pedal a bike, I don't mean make the crank go round and round. I mean, make the bike behave properly going into a corner so they don't have to hit the brakes. They can carry through. I mean, if you do they know what kind of courses they're riding? I ask for a course Bible for their next event when setting up a bike. 
Why do I ask? I hope everybody knows what a course Bible is. Mm -hmm. It should be available from any promoter telling you what the courses app and assorted other useful bits of information about the race. So the course Bible is important and I want to see how they pedal. I also want to figure out where they need to be on the bike. And by that, I don't mean one spot. I need them mobile so they can get weight forward. And for transfers into corners, I need traction as they exit the corner. So they're not slowing down. They're able to maintain the efficiency. So that's where I start. Great. Um, how about Tom? So uh, in the interview process, I ask a series of questions. And some of those questions, as you can imagine, are much more important than others. But there is one that I think is paramount to every fitting, regardless of discipline. And that is everybody comes to me with a preconceived goal in mind of what they're trying to accomplish and what they want to get out of their bike fitting experience. And that answer was something that they had decided on prior to them even reaching out to me in the first place. So they're here for a reason. And they're going to tell me exactly what they want in that answer, whether it be, and I've had people that all they really wanted me to do was put bar tape on their handlebars and they just wanted to make sure that they were in a position that wouldn't hurt themselves. And, you know, we could have done that, you know, fairly quickly, but they wanted to do a bike fitting and want to get the experience. And then I've had people that wanted to go through the whole experience and want me to explain everything. And they want every detail down to the nth degree. And, uh, you know, you guys have all experienced this in your fitting practice where everybody wants something different. And if you don't, I use the car uh, repair analogy in that if somebody comes to you or you take your car to somebody and it needs tires rotated, but they change the oil, regardless of how bad the oil needed changed, if you didn't rotate my tires, I'm not going to be happy with the service. So at the end of the day, people pay me to do a service. And if they're not happy, they're not going to tell other people about that. Regardless of what else I did, if I didn't do what they originally came to me for, I have, I have failed in my mission. So that, that question and answer period, that specific question is paramount to the, the way I'm going to conduct the entire fitting process. Yeah, great. Great. Paul. Okay. We have That's one more. Matthew or Paul? I can't remember. Paul. 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 Yeah. So um, uh, I'm, I'm loving hearing everything I'm hearing from all of you. That's I'm, I, I'm just going to say yes to all of that stuff um, because it's all good stuff. Um, our philosophy, I think, which was the root of the question, Mike, was is... Um, the way I the way I see it is, and the my why I do what I do is I'm a people guy, and uh, I enjoy helping people, and I think as fitters or or any 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 person doing anything that's that's doing a thing, um, and people are coming to you for help, um, if you just don't forget that that's what we're here for is to help them. It might sound simple but it's easy to get off in the weeds with all the other stuff that we can get off in the weeds about and forget that. So pretty important, uh, most important to me. Um, there's a couple of things that we say all the time that, that around here um, that I think put, put some uh, definition in my philosophy. The first is my, the, my business name uh, has perfect in it. And um, something we say all the time is, the perfect fit is a target, not a statement. And um, I just said that one day and I had an intern working with me and, and uh, he looked at me and he wrote that down. <laughs> and I, I've been saying it ever since uh, because it's true. This is, um, as all of you know, a process. Um, it's not one and done. Uh, we don't know it all. Uh, everybody's different. And I think the second thing that we say a lot is the only thing we can say in bike fitting for sure is it depends uh, because everybody's so unique. And I think this is a, a core value in my fit practice that makes me different 
maybe, uh, hopefully everybody's thinking this, but um, every situation is incredibly unique. Some things we see over and over and over, but still the whole, if you look at the whole um, uh, client uh, you're working with, big picture, um, that set of circumstances is really unique to them. So, so figuring out the best way, not just what they want, but, but, but how to help them understanding that the thing you did with that person yesterday may not work for that situation today. Um, I tell people all the time that, uh, because it's true and I want them to know that, because a lot of times people are coming to a fitter who they've heard about. Maybe you have a good reputation, their friends recommended you. So the expectations uh, can be high. And I, I, I like to meet those expectations as much as possible. But um, I estimate I've done somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 fits. Um, and uh, I tell people that I haven't seen it all and I don't know it all. And, um, that I love um, working with people to try to make it as good as it can be. And, um, and that's, that's it. I think that sums, sums, it up, sums it up for me. That's great, thank you. Um, to kind of wrap that around to the start, um, I really like, uh, you know, Happy talked about safety and making sure that that person's not gonna go kill themselves. And triathlon bikes are, uh, depending on the position that you put them in, can be really difficult to ride. Um, they can take time to acclimatize to that position. And it's a moving target. They're changing all the time. So safety is a big part of it. And Paul, what, what you were talking about, boiling it down to helping people is you and I are the same in that. Uh, number one most important thing I'm there to help people and I don't care what they're wanting to do. It's, it's their journey, not mine. So I love to hear that. I love to whoever's watching this. I hope they hear that we're there to help and to listen and, and to learn. We're learning every day, hopefully. Yeah, so, Michael, Michael, it's, it's, so what I see all the time is um, the triathletes come in with a preconceived idea of, I can be faster if you slam the stem, make me as low as possible, stretch me out on the bike as arrow as possible. But then part of the education is <clears throat> how long can you hold that position for? For a full Ironman, you're going to be on the bike for three, four, or five hours. Can you, you know, then? So we end up discussing a lot. And what Ann said is that we discuss, you have to include the your client because it's going to be eventually when you get done fitting them, they're going to be, higher than they thought they were going to be on in in the cockpit the, the the bars are going to be a little bit wider so they can as happy said they can breathe better um and you get the elbows and the upper arms in the right position so they're sitting against the bone instead of on their shoulders and uh yeah it's it's much more it, it's not what they expected but when they're done they can understand why you did it and how it's going to make them faster in general uh, the cleats have a lot to do with a tri-fit because, again, they are running and you don't want them to blow out their calves with the wrong cleat fit and then end up walking during the run. I've seen that a lot of times, too. So there's a lot of uh, important work done on the cleats. Um, and I, I do ask the question is, do you have a road bike? And I said, during the off season ride with some road groups get 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 on a team and get your bike handling skills up because um like i said i think in the last uh webinar i i refused to wave at triathletes on the road anymore um a couple of years ago i waved at this this lady coming the other way she was on her arrow bar she took her hand off the bars waved back and crashed you know it's it's they're, they're not yeah they they don't they know how to like ann said know how to run and swim but the bicycling is um, sometimes a little foreign to them. So, um, yeah, like Happy said, it's all about safety. Get them on the bike so they are safe and comfortable. The other thing is that, in general, 
my general philosophy is I guess I'm a little different than most of the fitters because most people come to me instead of get me fit on this bike so I can be faster. It's I it's one of two things I've read about people with knee pain and I don't want to get knee pain. I don't want to have any pains at all. So what can you do for me to make sure I don't have any pains going forward or I'm in severe pain. What can you do to get rid of my knee pain? And this? so it's, it's not about getting them fit optimally on a tri bike or a road bike. It's basically they have a, they want to alleviate certain pains. Um, they've been to other fitters that, either exacerbated that or or didn't fix it and you know we we end up working a lot with uh, multiple sessions with clients to get them uh, back on the bike so they don't have any uh debilitating uh pains to to pedal a bike with so that's the that's kind of the philosophy we have here i'm going to interject for a second and kind of touch up on some of the things that rick was just talking about um what I love about triathletes is that they love endurance and they like to have long, hard days and then they like to change it up. So I, I, I'm I proud to say that I have converted at least a dozen triathletes into becoming cyclocross riders. So you're talking about bike handling skills. You know, you can say to them, hey, once your triathlon season's over and maybe you've run a marathon in the fall or something like that, hey, uh, here's a sport that is kind of like a triathlon. You're going to get wet, uh, you're going to have to run, and you're going to have to ride a bike, but you only have to do it for about half an hour, and it's a blast. And they like a challenge. And, you know, I've had, certainly had triathletes who, you know, swim across Lake Michigan or something like that. So they love a challenge. And the bike can be very intimidating. Uh, so the fitting gives you a, 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 an arena to get them comfortable on a bike, have fun with it, not be intimidated by it. Uh, but I think going back to the original question that you had for me, Michael, is, you know, what's your, what's your secret? I think the thing to realize is that when it comes to a triathlete, they come to the bike tired. They always come to the bike tired roadies. We wake up late. We have a coffee. We go for a ride. We stop for another coffee. We go home. We take a shower. We watch a movie. Triathletes, they get up at 3 a.m. Uh, they go for a swim. Uh, then they have a protein shake. And then maybe they go to work. Uh, then they go for a run uh, or a bike. And then they go, you know, they have very long days. And so when they get to the actual event, they're already tired. They've been up since 2 or 3 a.m. to get to the start line. Then they wait around. So comfort and confidence, you have to anticipate that they're coming to the bike always tired. They're training 18 hours a week sometimes. Um, so I think that all ends up. Sorry, I, I rambled have, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little secret. I have offered this service for the last 25 years. I've had three people take me up on it. I will spend a day with you on a trainer or on rollers, watching you calculating decay rates. When does the core give out? When does the arms give out? When do the quads give out? And I will sit here and I will make a checklist for eight, 10, whatever hours it is, it's going to take you to do your estimated ride at Kona. And it's basically geared toward people who are going to Kona. I've had three people accept. We have spent undue hours. But what we do with that information is we have them change posture and position prior to breakdown. It helps cut their performance times, both on the bike and on the run. They're not as tired. My goal is to get them before lactic acid becomes an issue. Lactic acid is not a whole body issue. It can be just in your legs. It can be just in your quads. It can be just in your hands. So you got to look at everything in your calculations. And that's my secret weapon that's only been used mm -hmm. three times. Wow. Well, interesting. So, Michael, I have a transition question here. So a, a statement in a transition. Basically... 
here's a here's a thing that the fitters are going to have to consider and i want to get everybody's input on this you have road bikes here road bike fits and you have tri bike fits over here what about the college student what about the first time cyclist what about the person that's a first time triathlete they all have road bikes they come in with their road bike and aero bars and the elbow pads and they say put these on this is my new tri bike how are you going to fit them they have a road bike that they want to ride as a road bike they have a they have a road bike that's now they want you to convert into a tri bike how do you fit them so they can do both uh events and this is a very important question because this comes up all the time so with that michael i'll send it over to you and uh let's get the philosophy on that that's a, i think a good transition into some of the philosophy questions okay well that's question number eight so i'll tease you there um you know i think in some ways we have already talked about this but you have a person who needs help right here we are we're back to that same foundational piece of you have a client they need help maybe they're heading in a dangerous direction maybe you your knowledge has to help them understand that, wow, maybe that's, you know, consider this before you do this. And, or maybe you're making a, an assessment that says, wow, this could be dangerous for this person. Um, I had a client who, who wanted exactly what you're describing. It was a good rider, but not an experienced on aero bars ever. And I said, you know, we can set this up, but please go somewhere where there's no traffic. Please be very careful. And they went out. This person was a, a surgeon, went out on the weekend and fell off his bike and broke his right wrist. Uh, so guess what happens to a surgeon who has a broken right-handed person uh, with a broken wrist? Not too happy. <laughs> So again, you can all comment about this, but, and this is the kind of stuff I was really interested in is, you know, how do you guys approach educating people about, you know, hey, this is your first time on aero bars. It's a very different position. The steering is different. The weight uh, balance on the bike is different. All those things have to be addressed. And then if you're going to put the, clamp on aero bars there with the some of them have the elbow pads that don't adjust so now what do you do so you know this is a great question of course um we should probably limit it to less than an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and lead us in uh, well you know i i have certainly dealt with that exact scenario hundreds of times uh, and in, in the famous words of Paul, and, and I think Ray Buchanan at Serrano, it depends, uh, <laughs> which is always the worst thing to say, but you know, it depends on that rider, like you said. Um, I, I tease people to say, if it's on a road bike, it's not an aero bar. It's an armrest. There's nothing aerodynamic about clamping those things onto a drop bar. So we can dispel aerodynamics out of that. Secondarily, in terms of safety, uh, if someone wants to put a, a forward-facing seat post, uh, what is the rake and trail of that bike? What's the head tube angle? Is it an aggressive bike to start with? When we're talking about weight distribution, are you riding that bike in a way it's not designed to have you on it? And for people who are looking to become fitters, <laughs> The, the, the best way to understand bike handling is to ride a bike that is bent and to ride a bike beyond how it's designed to handle. Maybe it's got the wrong fork installed on it. Um, what I found that helped me a lot understanding physics and wheel per procession um, and bike geometry and how a frame builder builds bike, especially with front end distribution, is to look at motorcycle design and what they call the tank slapper and understanding what happens when the bike is pushed beyond what it's supposed to do, which a bike can ride without you on it. 
A, ride, a bike is designed to ride in a straight line without you on it. So when you're talking about safety and confidence, and to Michael's point, it isn't that easy just to slap an armrest onto a road bike. Um, so unfortunately it depends, but you also have to qualify that rider and understand how experienced they are. And I got to say, when the first time I ever rode a tri bike, I was terrified. <laughs> it's like, this is great. I'm riding really fast. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had ridden time trial bikes, but not in that steep, uh, steep triathlon position. I'm not a runner. Um, so to ride at 78, 79 sitting angle, as opposed to sitting back behind the bottom bracket, seven or eight centimeters, yeah, it's a world of difference. So as a, if you're learning bike fitting or getting into bike fitting, ride other bikes. Um, for me, I'm small, so it's hard for me to ride other bikes, but I've ridden some too small bikes for really tiny customers. And you know, wow, it's a lot different when the bike is made purpose built for that rider as opposed to the production bike. That's my short answer. <laughs> so I want to identify just for a second that um, people are using bikes, road bikes with aero bars for gravel riding, 200 mile gravel ride. They're using them on endurance events like uh, ride across Oregon, you know, they're doing a multi-day ride with long open stretches of nothing, and they're putting aero bars on there. So for the fitting public, the bike fitter public, I want to just identify that people are using them all over the place for different things, for different purposes. Yeah. So some of it's just endurance, some of it's speed. And like Paul says, you know, we're here to help, you know, and help means, you know, okay, let's help them make good decisions, right? Isn't that what it's all about? You can't stop them. You can't, you know, if you try to stop them, you'll piss them off and they won't like your work. So, you know, you try to help them achieve their goal, but not kill themselves in the process. All right. So maybe Paul, you're, you're right there. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, I'm a, I'm a, how it works guy. And so in my, in my practice all the time, we're, we're talking about that because I feel like if the person you're working with understands a little bit about how it works, then we, we can partner together be better to get a, a, a better result. And so I'll, I'll, I'll tell stories. Uh, I was there when the Scott DH bar happened. I was the first in Tampa Bay to have it on my bicycle. And I tell people um, what we were thinking was, wow, this is fast, but my neck hurts, my shoulders hurt, my crotch hurts and my back hurts. And um, cause that was my experience. Um, um, I was, a, uh, and, and, and triathletes are racing against the clock, no drafting. So they, 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 they know by the time they show up for a bike fit, uh, anyone with a, a set of aero bars just about is, is going to be thinking that it's um, going to be faster. Some of them are thinking it's going to be comfortable, um, and in some ways it can be. But um, so we'll just start there, so that um, when when we start working with them, they realize that just installing the aero bar by itself doesn't get us where we want to go. Um, everybody on this webinar and lots of other people probably understand that if you do that um, and don't change anything else on the road bike, let's assume that the fit's dialed. Good. They're happy. They're comfortable. It's working. Um, if you just install the aero bar, uh, lots of things can go sideways. The, the, the hip joint is going to be often overfolded. Um, the shoulder joints going to often be uh, overextended. Um, the, uh, just even getting the armrests, um, in a reasonable spot can be difficult. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't get in the way of them using aero bars on road bikes because a lot of times it's a hundred percent the right thing to do for them. But I do explain that, um, to really make the aero bar work, uh, optimally, we had to design a different bike. Uh, which became the tri-bike or the modern time trial bike. And um, 
And by this time in the conversation, people are starting to understand that while it's possible, um, maybe there's maybe there's compromises. Um, and so I'll talk through all of that so they understand what we're after. And then uh, from there, we'll we'll begin to uh, set it up so that it can work and that the bike can handle well and they can ride safely and they can be comfortable and um, and prevent injury. Um, this sometimes bleeds over into, I think, another topic we may get to um, of, you know, how how important is knee forward to foot um, in, a, in a bike fit setting. Um, so when we move the saddle forward to help with all the other challenges of the air bar, um, that's in play. And so, um, again, we may discuss that later, uh, but I'll, I'll save that. Um, I think that's all I need to say on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Yes, if I may, I think one of the things that we keep we skirt around a lot and we, everybody's talked about it, but hasn't said that we're managing expectations for people. Um, when people come in and they, they want to apply this, this or change this contact point, they want to put a arrow bar or a clip on, on their road bike. They're, they're literally changing a contact point from perhaps a very upright rest position where you can drink from your water bottle and, and socialize with your friends very easily, you're taking away that hand position and you're putting on a different hand position that is mm, perhaps not really possible at all. Um, but for whatever reason, whether they read it somewhere or they saw it on a friend's bike or you know whatever their, their process of getting to that point, they've decided to go this route. And sometimes you're literally talking them down from the ledge as to why did you, why, what was your thought process in going down this road and this route in order to come to this? And was that, was that something that you should have done? Is it going to get the, the result that you're seeking? Or is it actually going to be even more detrimental at other contact points like nose of the saddle pressure or low back pain, or, you know, it can manifest itself several different ways. So I think that's something that's like the, it's the, it's the thing in the back that nobody's talking about is that, you know, people have expectations and sometimes those expectations are simply not realistic. And we have to, we have to simply discuss that with them. We have to be that voice of reason. That's like, Hey, listen, you know, I, I understand what your thought process was, but your, your process was flawed and here's why, and it's nothing wrong with it. And it's certainly possible to do that. But oftentimes it comes down to that whole notion that just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And here's why. So. And that's a difficult conversation to have with a lot of people because often these people we deal with are A-type personalities. They're very driven. They're very, they're focused. They're, they've decided, and they simply want you to reinforce what they've already decided they want to do instead of you trying to talk them out of that. They want you to make it work. And sometimes that's simply not a realistic expectation. So. That's great. I, I want to just throw in there that, um, there's a theme going on here from all of you. And that theme is that we're having to listen and hear what these people need. And, you know, whether it's a tri bike or a road bike or a unicycle or whatever they're doing, we have to figure out and get on the right side of them and get, be able to help them. And, help them make good decisions. You know, we, we know some of the repercussions of those things, but, you know, sometimes somebody's doing cycle Oregon across Oregon for seven days, they're riding 80 miles a day and they're just recreational riders and they've seen their friends put arrow bars on. And if with a little bit of work, if you clamp them on there and make them high, a little higher up and they can just have another hand position, you know, they can lean on those bars and they love them, you know? So there's a whole bunch of different ways to look at it. And, you know, our job is really to hear, you know, which person is this? Is this the person trying to break the hour record or is this the person who's just looking for a little more comfort? So I really appreciate you allowing me to ask some of these questions and bend them in a way that 
hopefully is helpful to other fitters and that they see that it's not all about the little teeny details that we're fighting about, knee over pedal spindle or whatever, you know, those are important. We can get there eventually, but before that, we have to learn how to be helpers to these people. So, Michael, one more uh, thing. One, one more thing here is um, have have the fitters ask this question. I've I I sometimes ask based on what type of client you can tell what personality they have. I'll ask them, "Have you had a bike fit before?" And uh, most of them will say yes. And uh, I'll say, "What was the worst thing about the bike fit? What didn't you like about the bike fit that brings you here?" And the number one thing is that. The fitter didn't listen to me. They just did all these adjustments and said, there you go, and out the door. That was their number one complaint. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I want to hear Happy chime in here. They're getting an inexperienced triathlete, possibly no experience. So the first thing you need to know, besides the fact is whether the bike is safe to operate or not, does it fit even remotely close so we can adjust it? But what the hell are we doing it for? We need to know the course they're going to be riding on, the terrain they're going to be training on, so we can set up a bike that they can use in a safe manner. In, where I live in New York City, a lot of people do Lake Placid. Lake Placid has two characteristics. It goes up and down, and it turns left and right. I take people off their tribe, put them on their road bikes, because... If you want to scream through those corners and stay on the road, you are going to need a road bike, not a tri bike, unless you've got really good skills. So you need to know where it's going to be used and how it's going to be applied. The second thing you need to learn to say is no. No, I'm not going to put you at risk. No, I'm not going to put me in a position where I'm liable for your stupidity. No, the bike doesn't fit. Yes, you should take it back. I want to make sure that I'm very clear about those issues. And I do say no often. I When they buy mail order and the bike comes in, the uh, first question I ask is, are you under warranty so we can return it? People are like, what? Why? I did their sizing. So we'll just take a look. And it's all quite often no. This is not safe. No, this is not efficient. No, this is not going to fit you. It looks good on the page. It looks good in the box, but you don't look good on the bike. Yeah, well, I you, you said a one word in there that I really want to emphasize, and you said safety, and I it's think all that's... If you can't set somebody up to perform in a safe, comfortable, and efficient way, you're risking your reputation your, uh, as well as their injuries. I'm not willing to risk their injuries. Yeah. So I, I want to just say that I, I see, I've seen many, many people bring me a beautiful bike and it's got every whistle and bell on it and integrated everything. And uh, they get on it and the armrests are 20 centimeters below the seat. And, you know, it looks good, but if they were to put that on the road and ride it, they'd be <laughs> in trouble. So, you know, it's that, it's that whole thing of using our skills to make those choices and to sometimes have to say no and say, you know, this is really above your skill level right now and you're going to endanger yourself and um you know your back your body doesn't have the flexibility or the stability or any of that to be in that kind of position so i i i'm saying that to emphasize what happy is saying is that sometimes we have to kindly say you know this is really not a good match here and here's why here's the things that we're uh, concerned about so any other comments about that topic or, or are you ready to move to the next one i think the next one's good okay so this next one is um 
not specific road or try. You can bend it any way you want, but this is something that's really important to me. And I see this a lot, uh, a lot. People come to me, they wanna do a fitting, they have problems on their bike, whatever they are, neck, shoulders, back, hands, knees, and they get on their bike and instantly you look at them on their bike and you say, oh, okay, I see what's happening here. And so one of the things I end up doing is that I end up explaining what I see. So I take a picture or I take a video and I sit down with them and I say, hey, can I show you what I see here that you're doing or not doing? Or do you understand the biomechanics of your body? Well, no, nobody's ever told me anything like this, that I should sit like this because of a certain thing. So uh, I wanna hear from you. <clears throat> what are the most important parts, excuse me, um, what, common things do you see across many of your fittings? And my example was many of my clients have no idea <clears throat> how they're su supposed to sit on their bike from a posture perspective. So I end up talking about A, what I would like to see them do, um, and then B, you know, here's the things that are related to that. If you stand up, you know, my background is a lot of um, yoga and physical therapy. And if you stand up a hundred students and say, put your hands on their hips, well, they put their hands on the top of the pelvis, um, almost 90 some percent of them. The hip is down at the greater trochanter. That's where the joint is. So if you pivot from the top of your pelvis, your posture is gonna be not in a good place. So I just like to hear um, from you, you know, what, what, what do you see in your fittings? What are the things that um, you often see and you have to work with to help people? And let's see, let's shake it up. Let's go, let's go to, let's go to Rick. What do you see, Rick? I see um, every set of cleats comes in ill-adjusted so there that forces them to pedal incorrectly so that's the first thing we talk about and, and discuss um there's not enough uh, anterior pelvic rotation so i uh, we we do a few exercises to show them uh glued engagement or not glued engagement i call it uh most road guys are sitting vertically with their with their uh, pelvis and they have, um, I call it quad dominant cycling. And it's always, I went on a hundred mile ride and my quads gave out. Well, you know, if you rotate and engage the glutes, uh, have some um, uh, core stability, then you can ride much further, much longer and much stronger because you're engaging another whole muscle group. So there's a lot of off the bike, education before we get on the bike and now they understand how they're supposed to sit and pedal and um as we're doing those exercises I'll, I'll adjust the cleats get them on the bike and they say man this makes a difference i feel like actually i'm pushing against something now instead of twiddling on my toes <laughs> type of thing so uh that's where we go first great paul um we see a lot and it's all over the place. Um, I, I've said this already, but it's just crazy how unique every situation is. But um, one of the things that I see quite a bit uh, is uh, shoes that don't fit. Um, we we uh, look taking a fairly deep look at a person's feet is something that I do with every client. Uh, it's part of the assessment I do. And uh, I make lots and lots of custom insoles. I'm told more than anyone in the world on the retool uh, platform. I guess they know because I've bought more blanks than anyone. But um, on that note, they're really effective and um, they help people. So that works. But a lot of times people don't know what they need for foot support before they go shopping for shoes. And so... 
if they need um, more foot support than is in the shoe out of the box, then frequently they're going to buy a shoe that's too small. And what's too small? Too small is too short, too narrow, not voluminous enough, wrong shape. Uh, a lot of things can be too small. Um, so that's that's something that happens a lot. Uh, uh, I don't know what the percentage would be, but it's but it's really high. And if we can get them in the right shoe, then we can do all the other things that need to happen. We can uh, install wedges. Uh, if needed, shims if needed, uh, foot support if needed. We can get the cleats in the right spot. Sometimes certain models of shoes don't, don't let us get the cleats in the right spot. But most of the time, there's enough adjustability in the, in the, in the cleat that if the shoe is good, uh, the right size, uh, you'll have enough of adjustability to, to fix that. Um, yeah. So that's something we see a ton of. Paul, you brought up the five-letter word. Oh boy, W E D G E. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'll get that'll get bike fitters going. Ah! Right? <laughs> yeah, we should, we should take those to out and start over. We 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 take to, those out and start over. Yeah, usually. to wedge or not to wedge. That is wedge. the question. <laughs> and, Personally, and on the shoot, it the depends. Shoe topic, it right? depends. <laughs> the back to the shoe thing. Uh, I used I stop asking. I used to ask just for fun. Um, when people would come in with specialized shoes, I said, uh, uh, did, do you know that these shoes are wedged? Well, what's wedged? Well, they're tilted. Did you know that? Do you know why? And the answer uh, has never been yes, ever, ever, not even one time was the answer yes. The, I knew that uh, before you just told me. Uh, so, yeah, got to get the shoe right. <laughs> I'm so. time for me to be a little bit of a contrarian because I don't adjust the cleats first. I check to make sure they're not broken. They're not loose. I want to see them ride and I want to see them work with their foot where it is. With most floating pedals, you're going to get enough play in there to compensate because I'm correcting not from the bottom. I'm correcting from the hip. I'm using the glutes to control the lateral rotation. I'm doing it all using their own muscle groups rather than trying to do initially by changing the bike, the shoes, or their feet. I may come back to it at the end. I may send them out and let them ride and learn how to activate their glutes. I don't think cleat selection is as important as we used to. I think control of the core muscles, the pelvic floor, your hips, your hamstrings, your glutes, and the ability to isolate and control fine movements in these areas is far more important than your putting a shim or a wedge in. Right. Going along with that, you've got to learn to know how to make these muscles work. You've got to know how to activate them. Just knowing they're there doesn't mean anything. You need to be hands-on Sometimes you have to palpate to get the your patients. I call them patients uh, because I spent 20 years working in a hospital with doing this. You need to be able to get your hands on. I don't want to touch their cleats if possible at all. Why? Because in the end, when they go out and ride it, if there's a, compla a complaint, I have a baseline where I can go back to and start all over again. If I have changed everything, I don't know what the origin point of the new pain is. So I wait and leave the cleats placed where they to start off with. If I may expand on that just a hair. So something that Happy uh, kind of poked me with several years ago was this idea of don't be overly concerned with the cleats right out of the gate. Look at, look at the pelvis and work from the pelvis out instead of the feet up. We all know there's a certain fitter that is very adamant about working from the feet up, and he's taught many of us that technique, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I often see issues with cleats, but if, if the issues are power being produced at the pelvis 
and it's being transferred through several joints before being applied to this pedal system. And there's so many different pedal systems, even, you know, non-clipless, you know, pedals. You've got uh, people that are on recumbent bikes. You've got people that are on tri bikes. You've got people on a variety of different uh, ways of applying power. Those issues would be universal or at least more universal than they are if that was something that was more of a role. Um, and it took me longer than I'd like to admit to really uh, not pay as much attention to cleats as I did when I first started fitting. Um, and it was difficult, but it's changed the way I approach fitting. And in the long run, it's made more success with less time. Again, I much like happy. I make sure they're attached. I make sure that they're not worn out and I make sure that there's no issues with them and they're not all wonky and crooked. And, you know, I do a pay attention to rotational position and they're not up against the stops and all that kind of stuff. But it also comes back to what are their issues? What are they bringing to the table? What are their complaints? And if they're not having complaints or issues that are readily, you know, affected by cleat position, then that's probably not going to be the first place I'm going to start. And I think other people would agree with this. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, tell a quick, short analogy. Story time. This was true. Uh, driving in Colorado uh, on a very stormy day, um, traffic changes in the road. They detoured, you know, moved the lanes around on the highway um, car in front of us went off the road, flipped over three times, four people were ejected from the car. Um, we pulled over, ran over there, uh, two of us um, found, you know, you start trying to triage what's happening here. And we didn't check their cleats first. <laughs> we saw if they were breathing first and you know, they're breathing. Okay, good. No airways aren't blocked. Or is their heart beating? Yes. Okay, good. So there was a series of events that went on to get, you know, to the next person, you know, like we didn't see if they were cut or they had, you know, their fingernails were okay or whatever. You know, it was the big things first and kind of like Happy talks about and even Rick. Rick was saying, talking about it an anterior tilt and I'm going to tease Rick and say that in the in the trek seminars that I taught around the United States 50 50 bikers at a time you say the word anterior tilt and 40 of them look at you and like what it, they don't know what an anterior tilt is and you know I know we all think that we all know this stuff but I'll I'll tell you if we have a test it won't be pretty. <laughs> so yes, some of us do know all these, all this lingo and all this stuff, but your customers sure don't. So be careful what you're using. And, you know, you're all right. All of you are right in your processes. You know, it's like, nobody's wrong here. We're all trying to help the, these people. That's the goal. We're trying to help. So listening, education, helping. You know, there's the theme today that I'm hearing again and again. And whether you do it in whatever order, you know, how, how many clients do you have that you've ever done a fitting on and you test their core strength and, and it's just like off the charts, good. How many of them? What's the percentage? Not very many of them. So are they sitting in a postural way that they're just having an abundance of core strength? <laughs> not very many of them so you know we have to be realistic here and say it's like that car that flipped over three times you know we're, we're going to the things that really make the most difference and we don't have tons of time we might have two and a half hours to work with someone but it goes quick and you gotta you know you can get them to come back and follow up and maybe then like happy says maybe he'll come back and do more, but you want to get the biggest bang for your buck quickly. So Michael, so, let me give you a little better analogy than a car flipping over. You get a MotoGP racer. MotoGP is the highest cream of the crop motorcycle racing over in, in Europe. Uh, these guys are dialed in. Their cleats, there's something called rear sets. Rear set is the pegs 
and the shifters that you and the brake, the brake shifter on one on brake on one side, shifter on the other, and the rear set has the pegs. The cleat would be more of a better analogy is that those rear sets are in the wrong position for that rider and it's keeping them from being able to be in the right position and to be able to get good track times. If you take those cleats and move the rear sets into the right position so they have good stability and they can push on the motorcycle uh, as they go into a turn, then they're gonna get much better results. I think that's a better analogy than a car flipping over and seeing if they have cleats. Um, or here's another analogy for Tom. Let's say a car, you have a, a 1200 horsepower Mustang and you have uh, three inch uh, rear wheels on it. How good are those cleats going to handle? Is you're, you're going to spin them off all the time. They're not going to do their job. I think the cleats, why I mentioned the cleats, I'll get into one more thing here. I think I mentioned the cleats first because that's where they're noted. That's one of the three main touch points of them on the bicycle. And that is their basically their foundation that they're pushing against. And they can tell if you get the cleats adjusted right. Every one of my clients says that they are pushing harder on the pedals because now their feet are in the right position for their the way that they are sitting. Um, one step further, I would. Well, so two things. Number one is that we we could have a whole webinar on just cleats, and maybe we should in 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 the future. And number two. <laughs> is I wrote an article a couple of years ago for Lower Extremity Review Magazine. And I'm convinced that the bike fit really begins with the right size crank lengths. That determines everything. That determines how much pelvic movement you have, how much knee flexion and extension you have. That determines your range of motion that that person is able to produce on that bicycle. So I think even more, uh, critical is the crank length. And I think number two is the cleats. Number three is the saddle height. And number four is, is the cockpit um, as a kind of the lowest priority of all of those things together. So in that order, that's what we concentrate on here. You yeah. can't fire a cannon from a canoe. What was yeah. that? You can't fire a cannon from a canoe. Oh, well, you, you, yes, you can, but it's going to flip the canoe over. You can't fire it. <laughs> So, so here's the very danger that I wanted to try to avoid is that we all have uh, a method, uh, both in which, when we do what, but we're all trying to help yeah. a person. So I, I want to stay away from saying one is right or wrong. I don't think that's valuable to our listeners. I, you know, all of these things are important, whether we have time to do them in a fitting and i apologize my car analogy wasn't do they have cleats it was just saying that the the order of working with someone who flipped out of a car is not questionable they have you have to see if their heart's beating and they're breathing those are first and you know i was making a joke i wanted to make you guys laugh that's that was the goal there i am a little bit perfect. of it it was perfect yeah yeah so, um, great, thank you. Let's uh, let's keep going here. Let's do a, unless anybody else wants to comment on that last one. Um, I'm gonna ask one more kind of general I had a question. I, I can weigh in on that, just one more little bit. Um, and it's just to say this, and, and it, it sounds like we're all saying this, um, so maybe it doesn't need to be said, but uh, when when I'm I'm thinking about the feet, uh, I think it's probably a better way to say it. Everything that we were doing is um, in my practice is accommodative. I'm I'm not trying to change the human. Um, the human may change. Uh, they may get stronger uh, or not. They may get more flexible or not. They may get they lose weight or not. Um, but always, every time, whatever we're doing, um, we're, I'm trying to make it, uh, the interface between the person and the bike, um, as, as, um, amicable as possible. So when I, when I'm, I'm thinking about 
the feet and shoes. It's, does the shoe fit? Uh, is the cleat position in the way? Um, I am slow to apply interventions, extremely slow to, to apply interventions that are not accommodative. I almost never, ever uh, apply an intervention that I'm, where I'm trying to correct something. So that's it. Thank you. Well, I, I, uh, I appreciate all of your perspectives and I think that's what makes this a, a good webinar is that we all have a different way to look at it. Um, all of you have probably seen someone come in who has uh, their feet, they stand there without their shoes on and their feet, you're doing an eva evaluation of their body and their feet are, the toes are smashed on top of each other because they've been wearing really narrow shoes their whole life and maybe they're 60 and their feet have suffered from that and the arches have collapsed because the big toe is being pushed over. Um, but they don't have any problems, okay? So they're not complaining. They're not saying, oh, help me with this. Um, so, you know, and I know you're all thinking in your head right now what you might do or might not do or whatever, but, and that's all over the body. There's all kinds of that, you know? Um, somebody like Curtis, who was on the first webinar, who's a physical therapist, his mind's on overload and happy. You know, they see all this stuff. It's all over their body. So great. We're all, we're all on the same page here, um, but we can't. Uh, <laughs> you go where you can go and work with that person. You know, like sometimes you just have to say, you make a note of it. Like, yep, feet are compromised. And, you know, maybe you suggest uh, a larger shoe, it might be a little more comfortable for them. Next time you buy a new pair of shoes, choose a wider fit or, you know, but sometimes you don't get the opportunity to say anything because they have no problems. They have nothing for you to correct in their mind. Okay. I, you know, I just, just to interject really quick on that. Um, I live in a very large metropolitan city with any number of hospitals, uh, Northwestern, Rush, et cetera, et cetera. So when someone comes to me and they have gnarly feet, as a lot of runners do, um, bunions are a big one, uh, you know, yeah, uh, maybe a new shoe, you know, something wider, something more compliant. But I always say, hey, we are very blessed in the city with a lot of great clinicians. You should look at, and I will refer out, so I have a collection of clinicians in the area that I try to match them up. You know, like, yo, you live on the South side, you live on the North side, you know, go see this person, get a gait analysis done. Have you ever had a gait analysis done? Not at a shoe store, you know, have someone look at your biomechanics for running. And nine times out of 10, they've been running for years. They have put up with a lot of pain or they stop running. Uh, because of whatever reason, and they let it heal, but they don't solve a biomechanical issue of how they're running. Um, postpartum, especially women, not especially women, women who are postpartum, um, you know, could be pelvic floor issue. Um, so getting them to take care of themselves, the bike will adjust, but you need to take care of the body. And I'm not the one to do it. I'm not a clinician, but I know some really smart people. Um, if you're in New York, go see Happy. If you're out west, go see uh, Michael. Uh, so go see Dr. Lotus. You know, you're trying. That that's another one of my secrets. I refer people out to someone smarter. Good. Um, please be careful with your referral, in terms of. Uh, you may identify an area in their body that they don't want, they are not even aware of, and they don't uh, have any idea that it's there. And one of them is your mid back or your kyphotic region of your back. Um, many men, especially, have more kyphosis happening in that part of their back, and they're not even aware that it's affecting their neck. And so when you educate them that it is there, just be kind and realize that 
it takes time to decide that they want to work on those areas. Um, be, be careful about that. And I'm sure Happy could speak to that if he wants to. Happy? I, I want to. First thing, <laughs> you stay within the range of your education, your comfort zone, your training, and your experience. There's nothing wrong with saying, read about that in the book, but that's not the person you experiment with. You work within your training and your ability. I've been pushing the limits on where cycling will go since the beginning because Michael was the only other person to play ping pong with. There weren't a lot of us. So I had no limits because I had no boundaries. I still have no boundaries. But um, I have a lot more experience to make very different choices. You need to work on what you know. If you're making orthotics, take classes. Don't just work from what the manufacturer who's selling you the blanks taught you. Go take a pit orthos class or an orthotist class. I don't care if you pass. I don't care if you're just in auditing. So you learn to work with injuries and materials and you understand them much better. The more you know, the more you can do. The more you can do, the more we all learn how to do. We've been stretching limits for decades, and we're going to continue to do that. But that means you got to learn something. You have to have a vocabulary. You need to identify the body parts. You need to know what you're dealing with. And then go. I made everything for orthotics for club foot to orthotics for amputees. It's all in the same range. You need to understand the foot, the body above it, what you're trying to do, and can you do it? And you may come close, you may miss. That happens. That's a great point, Happy. Um, fitters aren't being taught much anatomy, kinesiology, or biomechanics. Those yeah. are three more to to add to your repertoire. But yeah, exactly. Education. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. Good point, Happy. Thanks. Fit, Go ahead. Fit schools, what I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, and with Happy and I, uh, if I can jump in there, Happy, uh, we didn't have anything going on in 1980 that was a fit school uh, to go to. And there was no Google either. So uh, we were up Schitt's Creek there for a long time. It took us a while to learn how to make a paddle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next thing that we can, if you guys will bear with me, I won't ask any more of these kind of questions. I'll be done for today. Um, what what are the most important parts of your bike fitting business? Not I didn't say practice, I said business. And we'll start with, let's go with uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, are you there? I think I think you're muted or something, Paul. It's, it's not coming through. You, sure. I don't know why. There you are. There you go. Hey, am I am I in there now? There you go. Yeah. Hello. Okay. So uh, I've been in this area my whole career, and so that's been <coughs> that's been really good, and I've enjoyed that. Um, it also means I've got lots of relationships. Uh, so I, I think what I could say, business wise, is take care of those relationships. They're important. There's nothing more valuable. Um, the What's evolved in my area is almost all of the bike stores now do not offer bike fitting mm. and they are sending their people who need bike fitting to me. I am blessed and grateful and humbled by that. Um, but um, I've always um, tried to do a good job my dad told me early on, uh, I don't care what you do. 
I don't care if you're a rubber band salesman, be the best rubber band salesman there is. And so from the time that he was following up my lawn mowing business and making sure I didn't leave anything standing uh, to this day, uh, that's just sort of who I am. And those relationships, both with clients and with um, the other uh, businesses that are that are that are in this together with us, uh, and and that's how I see it. We are all in this together. Um, just always do the right thing, and if you do the wrong thing on accident, say you're sorry, um, and um, you you won't the 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 line you do those things, the line might be long out the door. And um, so, yeah, that's that's it for me. Do a good job, take care of people, both client and community, uh, the professional community that surrounds all of our businesses. So that's it. Thank you. I, I just wanna quickly say, in all the years I've done bike fitting, I've never advertised anything ever. It's all been word of mouth. And to Paul's point, if you do a good job, people talk and they talk to each other and that relationship that you built with them, people then say, hey, I wanna go, I wanna go to that guy. He sounds really good. So yeah, good, good words, Paul. Um, Tom. So most important aspect of my business. Uh, and it's funny because my immediate first thought was relationships, ironically enough. Um, and I think everybody starts somewhere. Um, you, oh, you learn bike fitting at a weekend course or something like that. And uh, the most important part of my business has been that it's never enough. Um, a weekend is just a start. And the next week you have to put something into practice. And after you do several bike fitting courses, you find yourself taking information from a course like the medicine of cycling. And even if you only learn one thing out of 60 hours of, you know, instruction, how can I take that one thing and put it into practice immediately on Monday morning? So being able to take something that I've learned and put it into practice and make it valuable and then making a decision on, is that is that something that is valuable, not just to me, but to the client that I'm working with? Because if it's not valuable to the person that I'm working with, it's really of no value to me either. So that was probably the biggest, hardest thing for me to learn in business was <clears throat> I'm fitting people and people pay my bills. And those relationships that I built with people, they go out, they ride with friends, they talk about things and experiences they had when they had their fitting with me. And I get people that have come as a referral because they had a good experience. And that information that I used or learned and applied to that person that was valuable to them was valuable to my business. And I think that was one of the hardest lessons that I had to learn was that you're going to learn all kinds of stuff that is absolutely worthless. And to, to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff is probably the biggest challenge in bike fitting, because especially with the Internet, it, as, as saturated as bike fit information is right now, there's a lot of garbage information out there. And we've all seen it. We have people that come in and, and it's funny because my brother is a professional plumber. And nobody calls the plumber until they've tried everything they know how to do. You've done the Drano, you've, you know, you've torn the pipes apart, you've got this huge mess all over your bathroom, and you're like, nope, it's beyond me. Somebody has to help me that knows what they're doing. And that's why you come to me. Well, that experience of, you know, you're the garbage fitter that I'm bringing all my problems to, please help me clean this up. That has been the biggest challenge for me. And I think that's the biggest, most valuable portion of my business is being able to say, okay, what can I put into practice today that's actually of value to the person that's paying me today, not to me personally? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what they think. And that's for the same reason that I've never done any formal advertising. All of my advertising is word of mouth and I'm booked out for weeks. So 
I completely understand that whole thought process. And it took me several years to get there, but it was a valuable thing to get to. And I want to just add, uh, when I first met Tom uh, long ago, I don't know when it was, 18, <laughs> um, there was one characteristic that I would say about Tom. He was tenacious, like he wanted he wanted knowledge and he was on me. He's he's come out to see me. He's bugged me. He's emailed me. He's called me on the phone. And it's been wonderful. It's wonderful to see him doing this. So, you know, and 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 I haven't had as much contact with her, but also very hungry to learn. And I think that's something that we all share. Um, OK, thank you. Tom, uh, Anne, do you want to chime in? Um, I think, I, you know, things have changed for me, uh, getting out of retail um, and having my own place. And I think what's, you know, six years of my own business, all I do here in about 250 square feet <laughs> of a basement studio, uh, is I, I do, I'd only do one thing. I don't offer clothing. Um, I don't sell bikes. I don't work on bikes. I'm like, I mean, yeah, I can change a stem and I can put on seat posts and saddles and handlebars, but I'm not a mechanic. Um, I just kind of keep it simple and focused. Uh, I try not to have any mission creep, right? It was a big deal for me to like, put tires <laughs> to order in tires. Um, uh, so I think that's, I'm not selling anything here other than, you know, saddles, shoes, uh, and keeping it simple like that. I just sell one brand of shoes. I have a few brands of saddles. Um, and so I, I think I just try to focus on the rider not so much on the marketplace. And like everybody else here, I don't do any advertising. I have a pretty pretty lame Instagram account. <laughs> um, um, I just kind of do a little thing. I don't do a big thing. Okay, thank you. Happy, I think, did you, you haven't chimed in yet? Not yet. There's one asset I have that I devote a great deal of attention to. It's not my tools, it's not my lasers, it's not my library of saddles, it's me. I am the business. I am the person who interfaces with the customer. I am the one who has to keep learning to stay ahead of everybody else. I have to be taken care of. I, if you have health issues and you want to continue working, you have to be doubly attentive. The goal is to do this because I love it, which means I have to take care of my, myself. It doesn't mean that I'm going to fit in an extra fit at 8 o'clock at night because somebody just got to town and they're racing next week. I don't care. I do care. But I care more that I'm going to be fine the next day. We forget about us. We focus on everybody else. But the reality is if we don't take care of us, we can't take care of them. Great. Wonderfully said, Happy. And I want to just take a quick moment to say um, thank you. And, um, you know, with all of the tooling that is in our industry, these wonderful tools that we get all excited about. Um, the, the person, the monkey behind those tools, to me is the most important. You know, it's you take all the knowledge and all your experiences and all your ability to talk to someone kindly and compassionately, and you begin a fitting. But like Happy said, it's the person that has to be taken care of and has to be in good spirits and feeling like they want to give and help people. So super well said. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, um, you have to make sure you have lunch. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, take care of yourself. 
It could be yeah. hard. I mean, if you're trying to, I mean, I don't know how many in the peak season, you know, how many fits a day can you do? You have to know your limits, like you said earlier, uh, per week, per day. Um, if you try to do too much and you don't eat lunch, uh, you suffer or everything suffers. The work suffers. One and lunch, two lunches will get bushy. Say that again, Happy? It was one lunch, okay. Two lunches, oh. now you get... <laughs> right. Now, that's a great point, Happy. Take care of yourself. That's, that's important. Um, and like Ann said, is that don't overbook yourself. If you you can stress yourself out trying to finish a fit and you, there's another person waiting at the door and, you know, it's just uh, stress. Um, also, like Paul and Tom's comment, I I try to learn something new every fit. Number number one, and number two, what Tom was saying is that uh, it's it's the it's the customer that kind of comes first. They're they're there for a service, and um, um, you also you I try to in, involve them at every step of the process. How does that feel now compared to before? Does this feel better? How are you feeling? Is it, is the pain gone away? Does it feel like you can pedal more effectively? Does it feel like you can breathe better now? So every step of the, of the bike fit process, ask them how, how you're doing. And when you get done, there's no way that they can go back and say, oh, you missed this step or you missed this step because you're, 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 you're getting them every step of the process, getting their buy-in and yes, it is better. So um, that's, as I think that's kind of what Tom was saying at the same time, um, get involve them. And uh, uh, they're the, they're the reason why your door is open right now. So that's, that's keep, keep, uh, keep that. Uh, anyway, that's uh, in a nutshell. Thank you. Hey, I need to do a time. Add just a little bit to that. Tom's eating lunch right I, now. I do in my uh, interview process is identify the type of personality of the person that I'm dealing with. Some people want more information. Some people want less information. Some people are drivers. Some people are analytic, <clears throat> analyticals. And do, through the course of interviewing them, you learn how much information they want or desire. Mm -hmm. And that'll steer how I'm going to treat that person and how much information I'm going to give them. And that'll even make a fit very quick in some cases or in some cases extremely long. I've had the six, seven hour marathon fitting where you've explained everything six times over in seven different ways. And, you know, it's just a matter. And if that's what they want, that's what they want. And you have to provide that. Otherwise you're, you know, doing them a disservice. So sometimes it's just a matter of identifying what type of personality person you're dealing with. I, I think yeah, six or seven hour bike fitting, I commend you on, on getting through that. Uh, there's maybe even one in a hundred where Oh, gee, look at the time, uh, three hours. We have done a lot today. You have done a lot today. And I like to give them homework. Like, well, let's just focus on this this today and go ride, go outside. Uh, let, let's stop this here today. Um, look at all the work we've done. But let's say, uh, take two or three days to ride and then let's come back and, and do some more. Um, that's just me. Um, I don't think I could last for six hours in the film. Or one broken or... bolt. That's all it takes. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> okay. No, I totally, yeah. One, yeah. A stripped or broken bolt. I hear you. Okay. Yeah, I think Paul and Tom can both mm -hmm. confirm this is that the client's going to look at you as the mechanic, the salesperson and the advisor. Hey, as I'm going through my bike, if I'm pedaling on my bike, they come up with an idea. Um, what do you think about DI2? Do you think I can put DI2 on this bike? Um, why? Um, hey, I'm, I'm riding a nine speed. Do you think I can fit 11 speeds on this back wheel? I mean, they'll, they'll right? They come up with these things and you need to know that stuff to, to answer their, their questions. So it, it, there's a lot to learn in addition to just bike fitting, like Tom said, customer service, Paul was saying, um, knowing the the uh, technology and knowing what's out there in the, in the marketplace right now so you can s answer their questions. So there's a lot more than just bike fitting that they're gonna 
throw curveballs at you. They're going to say, well, yeah, I want to get bike fit on this thing, but in six months, I'm going to get a new bike. What do you think of this bike? And now you got to go look it up and say, well, wait, we'll, we'll hit that afterwards, but we'll see if the stack and reach of the frame is going to match what you currently have. If it, you know, so there's, again, as you know, there's a saying, when is a 56, not a 56, when it's a different company, or even when it's a different model within the same company. But uh, yeah, they're all different geometries. Uh, so you got to get brushed up on all of this stuff to, to be a holistic fitter. I guess that's a, there, there, there's a, there's your new business, Paul, holistic <laughs> fitting. So, so um, with that uh, timely idea, I'm going to ask what, uh, I don't have a clock in front of me. How much time do we have left? So what, what I'd like to do is have another five or six minutes of one more simple topic. And then what I'd like to do is throw, uh, have the, there's been a number of questions coming in from Eileen, Matthew, and uh, Ronit. I'd like to give, maybe have them um, go through and have one, maybe one quick question each or one comment each. There's questions and comments. Is that, how does that sound? That sounds great. Can you tell me what time it is? How much time do we have left total? We about 20, we're on 20 minutes left. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to set my little clock so that I'm respectful of everybody's time here. Um, that sounds great. Uh, one quick thing, since I didn't get to chime in about your time management that you're all talking about. Right. Um, that's really what it is, is time management. And if you have a schedule where you have multiple fittings booked weeks in advance, then you got to keep on that schedule. So um, there's a reason why your physical therapist never gives you more than three exercises at a time. They could give you 20 if they have the ability to, but they give you three because they know that you can probably remember three and you can probably go home and practice them. So time management is just communication skills. So we're learning to communicate clearly with them and that, they like it. People like that. Yeah. Okay. So what do you want to want to do our guest? Was that happy? Start with the guest. Okay. First. Yeah. Let's yeah. have uh, Eileen go ahead. Let me get you on the, uh, Add as a spotlight. Got to lean focus now on the main screen. Okay, so you had you had a couple of comments and questions. So go ahead, Eileen. You got uh, some time here. Okay. Well, I think it started in the beginning. I'm not sure how relevant it is now after listening to the whole panel. But um, in the beginning, my first question was: We're trying to fit tri triathletes, right? A lot of them don't have good bike skills. So one of the things that was mentioned is try and get them on a road bike, um, but they're going to race on their tri bike. So how do you guys respond to that? Like my thought process is if you're going to race on your tri bike, that's the bike you should be riding the most because that will give you the best skill on that bike. So how do you balance that with, um, I know there's safety because there's no brakes easily accessible. If you're switching gears, I understand all that, but um, where's the balance there? Cause so that was my first question. And my second one was, um, you know, I've been through the coaching for USAT and they do a section on uh, bike fitting. And to my horror, I've seen some of the coaches take that class and then fit people locally here. I'm in um, North Jersey. So uh, so two things I wanted to kind of throw out there and how do we stop that? <laughs> Can I lead off there? Yep, go ahead, Michael. Um, so the first idea that I wanna share with you is that uh, we're not all equal and um, I'm trying to get my words for this, but uh, you know, when you're working with someone on a tri fit, if you look at the elite level racers, so Tour de France level racers, and you say, how much 
how much time do those guys spend on their aero bar bikes? They don't, they, they don't, they may be one day a week, maybe. The rest of the time is all on the road bike. So, and you ask them, you know, what, why yep. don't you spend more time on this position? And they say, well, it's too extreme. There's no way. It's not a comfortable, this isn't a position that you go out and ride around <laughs> for a long time and see the countryside. This is a position to go kick ass. This is a fast position. So, you know, first you're kind of having to look at what is this athlete doing with their bike and how serious are they about the speed part of it? Because if you're training in a really aggressive position, it's hard on your body. I wouldn't want an athlete to train six days a week on that. So there's a whole bunch of different qualifiers in terms of what level athlete is it? Um, what are they doing? What are they wanting to do? It goes back to our original thing of how we're trying to make sure they're safe. And um, hopefully that helps you or at least stirs the group up and we'll have lots to say. Well, I'll just um, add a little bit more to my question on that. If you have a person without great riding skills they're probably not going to be that elite person right we're talking i'm specifically talking about oh i saw that <laughs> and <laughs> well I, I mean i would say 90% right. of what i do with is for age groupers right, right. Me too. so like that's the riding skills uh, for people who don't have the best riding skills and aren't spending eight hours minimally in a on the saddle um you know maybe they get four and we want them to be safe race day. That's kind of more of what my focus question is. Yeah. So during during the off season, it's we've seen the the greatest uh, success for triathletes because they don't have usually don't have good bike handling skills. If you get them on the road bike and start riding with groups, they will become more confident on the bike, they will become more confident in their abilities. And then when they do transition back to the tri bike, they'll be more confident at riding the bike and able to handle it a little bit better and go a little faster. It's just about like everybody's talking about, you get them on, on a bike in a, in a environment where there's other road guys right next to them. They will be picking up uh, there, there's a great group down here in San Diego, San Diego Bicycle Club. It's, there's about 500 members that show up on, on a given Saturday during the uh, summertime, and they got like seven different groups. And some of the beginner groups, they they go through all of the instructions, how to ride, how to turn, this and that, before the group rolls out. Those type of things are invaluable for triathletes to learn the basic bike handling skills, and they're going to become faster and safer when they transition back to their bike. That, that was why why we mentioned that. To answer your question, test. Find a loop about five to ten miles. Take your tri bike, take your road bike, ride both. See which is actually faster. I'm willing to bet with some of the age groupers and below they're going to be faster on their road bikes, not on their tri bikes. So test. Test. Good point too. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Whoever wants to jump in there. Paul, Paul I think you're muted. <laughs> Try it again. Yep. No, you're still muted, Paul. Try again, Paul. Right now. There you go. Yeah, yeah. there we go. All right. So um, uh, a lot of the world uh, and to triathletes who are trying to fit in three sports or if it's cold or whatever, there's a lot of indoor riding, whether it's road or try. Um, and um, I, I think that's great. But what can happen, there's so much of it that they get to race day and they just they haven't ridden whatever bike they're going to ride enough that they know that they know how to ride it. So whether they ride road or try um, somehow when it's possible, um, if we can convince them they need to get outside and learn how to ride your bike and, and what others have said here, uh, uh, join a bike club, do group rides, anything. But even if not, um, get outside. I, I tell people, go out on a windy day. Uh, don't let race day be the day that you have to learn how to deal with the wind. Um, so that's important. And, um, and I think you said this, uh, and I want to just 
say I agree with what you said um, about uh, the the specificity of the position. So wouldn't you want to ride the bike you're going to race um, uh, more if that's if that's the bike you're trying to perform on? And and I do think that that is relevant um, to Mike's point about the the World Tour riders uh, riding their TT bikes less because they're more aggressively positioned. I also agree with that. However, a lot of them are realizing that uh, overly aggressive, it doesn't equal faster. And so uh, I believe that a, a, a rider can, and I do this myself, um, I can ride a, a sub six minute 5K time trial, 30 miles an hour, no wind at 58 years old, by no means a world tour rider, but um, the position that I'm in personally to do that is comfortable. I'm not uncomfortable. And so part of our, and, and, and I can't lean over and get within a foot of my toes. So, so that just to put that into context, but uh, so figuring out how to set them up um, so that it can be safe, so that it can be comfortable and it can be fast. And all of those things are a hundred percent possible and then ride that bike enough uh, uh, that a, they're adapted to it functionally and B they know, they know what to expect out on the road. So I'm um, going to, uh, I just want to make a, a, a quick ad there. And I think for Eileen, uh, you had something about coaching. I'm not sure if you're a coach, but you know, let's just say the only bike somebody has is a tri bike. Um, that's all they're going to ride. So much of the sport is having distance between you and the next person, swimming, riding, running. So if you have someone who's really afraid of riding close to somebody, yeah, a road bike will help with that. But hey, have them run elbow to elbow with someone. Have them start small. Go for a run with someone you trust and, or, you know, a partner and run close together just to get, you know, vestibular visual system, proprioceptive of running closer together to someone. Then by the time you get to the bike, you know, hey, road bike, obviously you can ride more comfortably closer together. Tri bikes are just not meant to ride close and everything you do in the, in the sport is about keeping your distance. Um, no aero bars allowed in the group ride, that sort of thing. Uh, but again, in terms of fitting, if I've had someone that, let's just, I'm just grabbing numbers. If they're sitting with their nose of saddle with zero step back from the BB and they go out and they ride and they don't feel comfortable, I'm going to move them back. I'm not going to worry about their biomechanical transition, you know, quad utilization versus hamstring utilization when they go for the run, you know, they're trying to mimic their run gait on a trot bike. But if they can't ride comfortably, we're going to dial that back for the first month or so. Maybe they're going to ride um, sitting further back than what we would normally say is a triathlon position. Maybe a month later, they'll scoot forward. You know what I mean? Uh, so I guess back to what's our theme, our theme phrase for the day is it depends, right? Uh, but yeah, if, they, if, if they're going to be racing on a bike, they should be training on that bike. And like Rick says, you know, off season is when you develop skills. So they may have to learn a, a more narrow version of bike riding, which is riding alone with, what is it, three meters of space, uh, no drafting, that sort of thing. Um, so that, that that can be a longer term thing. Hey, we got seven minutes. Left. So let's uh, get Matthew in. Let me grab Matthew and spotlight him. There he goes. Okay, so Matthew, you had a couple of things to mention also? Uh, yeah, just in the in the process of listening, um, it just it, first of all, it's a thrill to be able to be part of this and hear everybody, um, you know, posit their opinions and listen to what everybody has to say. There's a lot of great minds in this group and I'm thankful to be here. Um, 
And uh, it's nice to hear a lot of the things that I'm doing are also being echoed by people with more experience than me. So that's nice. Um, so just a couple of things that I've heard that I uh, just wanted to kind of touch upon myself is that when it comes to like um, the conversation I'm having with my client who's in, I usually refer to areas of concern. We talked about, you know, uh, clustered toes and maybe bunions and collapsed arches, kyphosis and things. And I always refer to those as biomechanical adaptations because that's essentially what they are. Um, and uh, to, it tends to soften the blow a little bit. It doesn't make it something that they have to focus on. It's just, oh, okay, we have to maybe draw attention to it, but it's not bad. It's just a thing. Um, Tom and I are about a stone's throw away from each other comparatively to a lot of the other people in this group. And we've both seen, I'm sure, a lot of shops that have just, and I'm on the receiving end of this right now, a lot of shops that just don't see the value in it. And I know just about, my prediction is that in 10 years, most of the, most shops are going to have to rely heavily on service and peripherals to keep themselves afloat if they want to stay a bike shop. Most, most bicycle companies, whether they want to admit it or not, are probably going to go omni-channel and direct to consumer. And they're going to have to rely on more along the lines of mechanics and people like us who do fittings and a lot of the peripheral items that they can sell to be able to stay afloat. It's going to change the entire business model. Um, and third, the main thing that I was touching upon and wanted to ask is um, a lot of people come in, especially those of us in the Midwest and, you know, Ann's in Chicago, we have a roughly, if we're lucky, about a six to eight month, eight, eight month window of being able to ride. So what I've tried to do is cultivate more people to get their fits closer to the off season so they have time to maybe adapt to a new position, as opposed to coming in in July and saying, hey, I've got my half Ironman in two weeks, can I do a fit? You can, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> so I was wondering if, if anybody in here has had any success or has uh, tried to do that. I'll jump in there. It depends. It depends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if accommodate an injury? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it comes back to their what what's their goal? If they're coming to you and there's two weeks until their event and they've ramped up their volume and intensity to a point beyond what their nervous system is capable of adapting to, which is super common with age groupers. They, you know, they've never done a full Ironman before and they've way overdone it over the past two months and, you know, they're tapped out and all they're trying to do is get to yeah. their event. Um, oftentimes, I'm just literally talking them down off the ledge. You know, it's like they they're questioning everything. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? What have I done for myself? I put my family through all this pain and misery. My wife's pissed at me. My God, what have I done? Let's put your saddle down, you know, half a centimeter or eight millimeters and get your hamstrings to calm down because your pelvis is pissed because you haven't done any stretching in the past two months and go do your event and come back and see me when you're done. If you're still in one piece and you're looking to do this again and you haven't rode off your bike and thrown it in the lake, then, yeah, we can work forward from there. But to make drastic changes two weeks out is a recipe for disaster. But almost always you can make a small yep. change that will have a huge impact. Yeah, a one centimeter uh, change in arm pad stack height can work. Game changers. Yeah. Yeah. You just like can't I be said, afraid you... to make the change. That's all. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're on to three minutes. Um, so, Ron, Ron, it did you have something to go ahead and unmute? Did you have something to add? You had a couple comments in there too. Yeah, what I'm saying is the average wealth in India is quite a bit less than in the uh, countries that you fit in. So, uh, most of the people who do triathlons here do it on a road bike because they can't afford anything better. So um, I am thinking about a 27.2 seat post, which can be forward offset. I'm thinking about a shorter crank. Is there anything more obvious which I'm missing? Think of the rider. And yeah. then think okay. put on the bike. Yeah, okay. Not the other way around. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, Ron had, had, a, had one of his comments was um, interesting. He said, uh, if... If you have a road bike that you're putting 
arrow bar is on. So the person is going to ride a tri event and then wants to go back to the road bike, etc. Have two separate seat posts with two separate saddles, one set for the tri fit and one set for the road fit, and just swap, mark the saddles, mark the, the, the seat post, and pop it in. Okay, there's your road bike. Pop it out. Put the new saddle in. That's a that's a unique way of uh, actually looking at it. That might be something to for Paul to experience. Uh, put it together and let us know how that goes. I, I've done that on done some it? occasions. Um, kind of going back to what you said earlier that how the crank arm length really is a, a much bigger driver in triathlon um, output than it is for road. So for a lot, for some people, you know, it's not just the seat post uh, swap or the arm pad addition. Well, you're going to change your crank arm length with that road bike back and forth, back and forth between road and try. Um, so it doesn't, sometimes it's too much money or it's too much time and effort. So I, I get, it depends, right? <laughs> does just does the seat post forward and the arm pad add make that big of a difference for that rider to run better, more efficiently off the bike. Um, so it's it's kind of a cost benefit ratio in some in regards. How much money they want to put into changing that <clears throat> road bike back and forth, um, or you know I'm going to get a tri bike next season, but this is what I'm using for now. Okay, so um, do you think it would make that much of a um, difference if? And this is for the panel. If somebody was set up efficiently with a 165 on their road bike and their tri bike was a 160, why would it, would you just leave it as a 160 and then just swap the, I mean, it's always safer. They're just spinning a little faster and they have a, I mean, they already have 11 or 12 gears in the back. They could just adjust it that way. Does it make that much difference? I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and say, uh, two. Oh, Michael, you froze. Oh no, Michael froze. Okay, so let's while he's unfreezing, let's go with Paul or Tom. Uh, thoughts on that? Would you just want to leave it as a one sixty and have him first right both? Uh, okay, Mike, Michael's back. Okay, Michael, you froze you, up, you froze, so you may so have to repeat. You have to repeat. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in there and say, uh, changing things on the bike is easy to do and, uh, you can spend lots of money, but tuning the engine of the vehicle is always the most effective first, because if your core strength is better, if your alignment is better, if you have more mobility, everything gets better. So yes, yes, we can go back and forth. Maybe sometimes, uh, all valid things. Um, when when we get to the end of this, I have some. I've been taking notes, and I have uh, looks like seven titles of things that I want to quickly share that you all said, and then I want to talk about uh, the next webinar. And Rick can you, you may or may not see me again if Rick doesn't like me anymore. Then disappear, but um, so I'll leave that. Right. Down. Rick can jump in there and say what's next or yeah, happy. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's have Paul and Tom quickly um, address the, the last question uh, about crank lengths on just leave the crank as a shorter and then readjust the saddle. Is that advisable? Go ahead, Paul. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Oh, Paul unmutes. <laughs> All right. So my thought is if if they're capable of pedaling the 165 as effectively as the 160, it'll be fine. Uh, and a lot of people won't notice a huge difference between that much uh, crank length change between two bikes. So if that's the case, I would say, yes, just adjust the saddle height a little bit and, you know, you should be fine in most cases. Uh if you're like me and you've had, uh, you know, hip surgery and a labrum repair, I'm going to notice the difference between those two crank lengths and it's going to be a problem. Uh, if I ride my mountain bike with a 170 crank and I ride my gravel bike with a 155, after 10 miles on the mountain bike, my hip is not happy. I can do it, but I'm going to be paying for that for the next couple of days. 
So it just, again, it comes back to, it depends. It, it has more to do with the functionality than the actual performance aspect. It's a matter of, can that person do it? If they can, no problem at all. If they can't, you got to make the change. Yeah. Paul? Yes and, yes and amen uh, to everything Tom uh, just said and said well. 100% agree with all of that. So nothing else to say. So Michael, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Michael, take us out. Go ahead. Uh, You're up. So I'm going to reflect uh, the things that I think are really that I heard you say that I really liked. And number one was um, listening. Number two was helping people. Number three was education. Number four was relationships. Number five was I am the business, each of you. Number six was learn something new every day. Number seven was time management. And by no means is that order of importance. It's just seven things that were reoccurring themes within everything you said. And, you know, I hear you talk about, I, I'm going to be sarcastic here, but I hear you talk about tri bike, road bike, blah, 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 bike. And per, for a while there, it was kind of blurred. Like you guys were just talking about working with people on their bikes and helping them. And I laughed. I thought, wow, cool. Like there's a motto there. Let's just try to use our knowledge however we want to do it in whatever order, whether it's the feet or the hips or the whatever. Um, so here's one. Here's my, I'll, I'll say this and I'll be done. You won't, you won't have to hear me anymore. But um, I would like to do a webinar about how you guys think we can come together as a group. I mean, how many bike fitters we need somehow, some kind of a organization and whether it's what's out there that we work with them and create an over, you know, Anne in the last webinar uh, talked her first questions and said, do you guys have a, an overseeing body for your fitters? And the question, everybody said, no. And the second question was, well, does the industry support your bike fitting? No. Okay, so I want to have a, I want us to have business 100 years from now. So how do we, as bike fitters, work together and bring all of that knowledge under one umbrella and make it thrive and not that one person's technique is correct and somebody else's is wrong no we're, we, we need to embrace everybody if you put all of us in the united states in a room it'd be a small room there isn't a lot of us that are really passionate about this so we have to work together and i'd love to have a webinar the whole thing talking about ideas that you guys think that would help us bring that together under an umbrella that we can form some kind of an educational thing, talk about all these things, all these tools and things we need to go forward as an industry. Because otherwise we're gonna, the industry's trying to kill us. Um, they're not helping us, they don't. Trek, Trek had a fit program, it's and, gone. Yeah. It's canned because they don't need it to sell bikes. They, they don't care about the industry. They care about selling bikes. So that's it. I'm, so Michael, I'm, <laughs> our, next, our next webinar is um, December 14th at nine o'clock. Oh. And since we don't have a topic, why don't we select this topic with the same panel and continue as part two? And uh, we'll have Michael lead us into it again, if everybody agrees. How does that sound? Thumbs up there. Here. Okay. I would agree, but I'd rather have uh, our two guests also be part of that as well. Oh, because yeah. Because they yeah, yeah. are the, what would be the future of this. If we're more experienced and older and have more, you know, knowledge and that's the people we need to share it with because, and there's going to be a whole nother set of people behind them that are going to need to learn this information as well. So we is that the Craig, purpose? 
Yeah, we got Craig Folk coming too, which is going to help. Um, he's oh, Craig's a knowledgeable guy. Yeah, too. Craig, Craig's going to be on the next one as as well. So, I think that'd be a great uh, um, a great topic, Michael. That's, That's awesome, fantastic. I think there there's our next webinar. And if anybody else, so this is going to be recorded and pushed out um, uh, to the internet. And if anybody has any um, requests to be on the panel, um, email me and we'll start putting together. We got Paul, Tom, Ann, Michael, Happy, Eileen, Matthew, and Craig currently. If anybody else wants to attend, hey, we'll... Um, Michael will have a little more, a few more balls to juggle, but uh, I'm sure he'll do a great job and we'll go from there. Sounds great. Had a great time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Sounds Pleasure good. seeing everybody. Good time. Thank, Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care.